Well, hello there folks, it's Stephen here from Movie Burner Entertainment, once again back with another movie review, and today I am going to follow up my movie review, Back to the Future, with the sequel, Back to the Future Part 2, which came out in 1989. A flying DeLorean, what the hell is going on? This film was directed by Robert Zemeckis once again, and was also written again by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, starring Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, Leah Thompson and Thomas F. Wilson. Now, four long years we had waited to see what had happened to Marty and Jennifer's kids at the tail end of the original movie. In reality, those closing scenes to the classic 1985 film was intended to be a joke by Robert Zemeckis. The director or writer never intended or had a grand scheme on what happened after the original movie. Remember, again, the Bobs had a hard sell in that movie and thankfully that saw the light of day. There was one thing we knew going into the sequel and that was our favourites Marty and Doc along with Jennifer were heading to the future, 2015 to be exact. You have to take yourself back to 1989 and remember a time before the internet and flat screen televisions etc. Amazingly the filmmakers actually got a lot of the tech correct back then and a lot of the gadgets we see in the future became a reality. There are endless YouTube videos listing all the predictions that came true in 2015 which ironically is now the past. As a 13 year old kid I was eager to see what the future was like in Hill Valley and it didn't disappoint. Marty was suited and booted with a fit adjusting jacket and a pair of Nike power laced boots. In fact, I didn't have to wait long until I saw something I believed was real at the time and I commend the special effects and choreography teams for making us believe that hoverboards were actually real and fully functioning pieces of equipment back then. And even if they weren't, then surely 30 years down the line we would have them. Yeah, right. One of the things I loved about this sequel was the fact that they did something that had never been done before and something that you could only do in a film involving time travel and that was to revisit the events of the first film from a different perspective. Before that though, Marty and Doc had to fix a little issue in the future that they successfully manage. While Marty is waiting for Doc to collect Einstein, his dog from 1985, he visits the Blast from the Past antique shop and purchases the book. Grey Sports Almanac, a book of sporting facts and statistics that Marty sees as a way to make a few bucks on the side. Unfortunately for Marty and Doc, Old Biff heard Marty's plans and manages to steal the book and the DeLorean and give himself the book back in 1955. November 5th, 1955 to be precise, while Doc and Marty are on a mission trying to retrieve Jennifer from her future home. With Biff altering time, Marty, Jennifer and Doc arrive back in an alternative 1985, unknowing what has happened until Marty confronts the now very rich Biff on when he received the book. I have to say that as much as I loved the 2015 Hill Valley for its glossy and crisp looking facade, I have to admit I loved the gritty and dark alternative 1985 Hill Valley equally. There is something sinister and disturbing about seeing the town and its suburbs in disarray and crime is everywhere and it's something I felt would have been interesting to stay in a little longer. This is where the level of mind melting hits the max and I have to say that it took me multiple viewings to get my head around Marty and Doc revisiting Hill Valley on November 5th 1955. Not only seeing this vibrant town in all its glory again and taking me back to the originals but also seeing our heroes avoiding their other selves was a main job thanks to Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. It still amazes me the precision and attention to detail the filmmakers went to to make sure that the time frame everything happens in Back to the Future Part 2 doesn't contradict what happened in the original movie. The last 40 minutes of the film is really Marty and Doc pursuing Biff for the Almanac and trying their best not to interact with anyone, especially themselves. What can I say about the ending? With the timeline corrected after a successful mission, Doc Brown, whilst hovering in the time machine in the air, is struck by lightning, sending him in a loop and vanishing to God knows where. This leaves poor Marty stranded in 1955 and receiving a letter from a Western Union guy at this precise point and at this precise moment that they had in their possession for almost 70 years. It is revealed to be from the Doc who is living now in the Old West, 1885 to be precise, and has given Marty explicit instructions on where to find the DeLorean and how to fix it so his friend can return to 1985 and destroy the time machine. This of course sets up the third part of the franchise which I will review soon, 
Back to Future Part 2 took great risks in its storytelling. It took some great risks in its visuals as a lot of the technology used in the movie was prototype and hadn't been used before. Vista Glide was a robotic motion controlled camera dolly system that allowed an actor to play two or more parts in a single scene with a computer controlling the pan, tilt, focus, zoom and the split line during each pass. It was developed for the use in Back to the Future Part 2 and Part 3. One noticeable absentee from the original cast is Crispin Glover, although I think at the time it wasn't so obvious. I've seen multiple interviews from the actor and the producer given their version of events on why the star wasn't present for either of the sequels and the problems this gave the writers. I'd be foolish to take either side on this matter as I wasn't there and if anything came out of the whole debacle that was that Glover won a lawsuit against filmmakers using actors' likeness who aren't in the film or have any part of the film as the prosthetics used in the original film to give Glover an older appearance using the actor's face mould was used on another actor to give the illusion that the same actor was being used in the sequels. Personally I spotted this the very first time I saw the movie as the camera angles were obscure and more evidently was that the character of George, who was so prominent in the first movie, was nothing more than a bit part in the sequel sadly. Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, Leah Thompson and Thomas F. Wilson stepped up and really made the sequels as best they could and delivered standout performances once again. The four recreated the magic of the first movie and maintained the level of comedy required for the roles. Wilson more so, as I felt that the second part was Biff's movie and the actor stand-up really performs really well as 1985 Biff, 2015 Old Biff, 1955 Young Biff and the oddball Griff who was Biff's grandson in the future. Fox and Lloyd again carry the narration along and again perform brilliantly. Overall Back to the Future Part 2 is one of my favourite sequels and it holds up there with the original for different reasons. The second part is technically better than the original for the future scenes as far as the design go and for the logistics of how the technology works in the future. In the real world, as mentioned, the filming techniques were still before digital technology and some of the scenes, although maybe a little dated now, still hold up and my appreciation for the creation of the Vista Glide system is something I am still in awe with for its boldness and its subtle use in parts 2 and 3. Back to the Future Part 2 is still a movie I can go back to and I never scoff at the future scenes, which are of course in the past now. As Robert Zemeckis once said, you can never set the future correctly, so don't take it too seriously. For anyone who hasn't seen this movie, I would urge you to find a copy of it currently shown on Netflix and watch it. But only after you've watched the classic original. I can't recommend this film enough.